It was so unexpected. You had to be there. Covering Celtic at that time was a brilliant thing. The atmosphere at Parkhead was always great. You had to be there. Nobody ever talks about this game. Nobody saw it. Uh, you had to be there. Right, it is episode three of You Had To Be There. The simple premise is you're at an event for work and you fall back in love with the sport because you're witnessing something amazing. I'm very excited about this week. It's Graham Hunter. Graham, how are you? Well, equally excited. And I've been listening to your chat about the Dobbs and listening to the adverts there about sandals and socks. It's a very, it's a very witty station you work on. I do <laughs> love, I do love this program. And I, I'd pay it to be a listener. Uh, never than, never mind. Just come on and talk about great games of football. Nevertheless, here we are. And I'm I'm ready for what you have you got through. And Bosnich, I'm Bosnich doesn't get a mention, I'm sorry. Okay, fair mind. enough, fair enough. Um maybe just because you weren't at the game. I mean, obviously if you had been, could you be, might anyway. <laughs> could be, could be. I've had some moments with Bosie, but anyway, let, let's let's reveal the picks. Okay, the right. You can keep keep those for your book. Um Alex Ferguson in nineteen ninety nine at the Champions League final. This is um, this is your first one. So, obviously, people will be familiar with the fact, and, and maybe there are some younger listeners who aren't, but uh, Bayern, <laughs> Bayern Munich are uh, winning the game in stoppage time and Manchester United scored two late goals to win it in Barcelona at the Camp Nou. And um, you, you could have picked a load of different people, I suspect, from this. Why Ferguson? There, there's a, a little bit of bias. But also, I was answering um, when one of your colleagues, one of your team came on to me, I was a, a, answering the idea that... Because you, you introduced it by saying it's a very simple concept. I, d- I don't think it is, because if you're asking people who are fortunate enough, privileged enough to be paid to be at gigantic sports events about moments of people's or people, individual people or, or game that takes their breath away and makes them go, yeah, look, this is this is what it's all about. This is why I love the sport. This is why I, I'm in this profession. When you become overwhelmed and taken to a different place, then I, I need to deal in the fact that, you know, for, for my, I'm the Daily Mail's chief reporter that day. I'm, I'm at Camp Now. I've followed Manchester United in all their competitions towards a potential travel to the Camp Now, to a city where I love. I'm not yet planning to live there, but I'm, I'm, I'm just the stadium, the Camp Now is, is phenomenal. And he, to me, he still subconsciously, but it emerges during the game, particularly in the latter seconds, he's still the Aberdeen manager. There's no skulls, no keen. I've been in Turin for the semi-final and seen a club and a fan base who were remorseless. They were un, uh, impermeable, unbeaten. Applaud Manchester United off the pitch in Turin. But they go there without two absolutely central players against an equally remorseless team that people forget Bayern Munich were tilting for the treble too. You know, had they won that night, they had one domestic trophy still to one win, which they then they did go back and win. It was their treble, and you know he plays um, Beckham in midfield to try and cope with the absence of Keenan Scholes, but also to finally answer what Beckham's been tugging at his sleeve for months. At boss, boss, I'm a, I'm a better central midfielder than I am at the right. And and what happens is that you know this tired, um, pretty drained squad that doesn't perform, and no matter what Alex Ferguson has said subsequently about the you know we were always on top. I always thought we were playing. People have exaggerated how much Bayern Bayern could have won it by a street. Manchester United didn't represent themselves particularly well, but he juggled. He won he, at, at that stage. It wasn't simply the the gambler's instinct that was going to see him through. He juggled options. He eventually moved Beckham back to the right. He eventually gets Sheringham and Solskjaer on, not to add to Cole and York, but to supplant them. And he frees up um, Schmeichel. Maybe it seems obvious to, to go on his big rangy run up to the box because everything then is, you know, the it's all or nothing. And, I, and I'm sitting there, having seen Alex, having known him individually, having seen him do special things for my club where you're like, I'm not quite sure how or why this is happening, but it keeps happening around Alex Ferguson. And that night in the camp now was overwhelming because of the, the noise, the heat, the the fact that I've never been at a match, reporting on a match, which potentially could bring a treble for anybody before. It seems to be gone. You, you're under terrible pressure to be writing a thousand words. You're asked to file all thousand words 15 minutes before the final whistle. So the, the newspaper has everything set, the words, the headlines, the pictures with about, you know, setting it takes five minutes. So 10 minutes before the end of the match, it's Bayern with the treble, bad night for a thousand words. 
And bosh, they, they, you know, Ferguson, um, when Steve McLaren, we don't know at the time, but you can see the activity in the dugout when Steve McLaren's going great, extra time, start playing for, for extra time. I don't know what's going down in the dugout, but what's patently clear is that Manchester United, from top to bottom, starting from their manager, are like, never mind. It wasn't just on the touchline, it was in the pitch too, because of everything he taught them, everything he'd imbued in them, the type of player he, that he bought... The every single player in red were like, we're still trying to win it. We will win it. And they did. And it wasn't a fluke. And it wasn't because Bayern collapsed in football terms. And it took me out of, you know, I was, I was doing my job, which felt pressurised. It felt a big responsibility. In the end, what I did in, in the minutes from sharing and scoring where you're starting to rewrite and you've got people screaming at you from London saying the entire cities, there are cities that won't get this edition of the paper unless you, and you're typing and you're thinking and you're watching and this, this bit's off the record. So if you can cut this out, <laughs> like there's a tear. I can't see the screen properly because the, the bear with me, the Aberdeen manager is about to win the Champions League. That You asked me about a moment that takes you out of it's just a job, I'm working here. And the combination of that witch's brew was as powerful, as impactful as I've ever been present at in, in anything in my career. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life because of who read the report that I wrote. But it was about Fergie, coping, reacting, everything he taught people over the years of being their leader, their monster, their, their sergeant major. And it was just simply a moment of transcendental pressure, magic, beauty. And I don't really expect to be present at anything like it again. That's the forging of diamonds, I believe. They, they talk about pressure situations like that. And so um, you just slipped it in casually there. Who, who read the report that changed your life? Well, I, I don't know that anybody's you know, <laughs> listening is going to be interested, but Vic Wakeling was head of Sky Sports. And he was at the game, obviously, producing the event for Sky. Way back in his career, he'd been a print journalist. So he told us um, a couple of months later when he had a big dinner for all the football correspondents at the beginning of the new season that he'd he'd got up, got his breakfast at the Princess Sophia Hotel at the top of their street leading at the camp. Now, went to the airport a bit glum, a bit forlorn because he expected to pick up the first editions of new English newspaper, British newspapers in the airport to read... Bayern win the treble, or Bayern take the treble away, United flop and that, because often in the past, for those who don't remember it, if, if things didn't happen soon enough for first editions of newspapers, then many, many match reports were just completely wrong because the, the print button was pressed and the lorries rolled so that far-flung places could get an edition even if the sport was wrong. And he told me, in front of my colleagues, that he went to the airport, picked up the, the mail. He happened to be a, a mail reader because he'd worked for the mail in the past. Picked it up, and, and he literally said that he, he was, you know, as proud as he'd ever been of reading a British newspaper ever. Now, his values might be different from everybody <laughs> else's, but he picked it up, and I, I had something about Manchester United, uh, Manchester United last night producing the football version of turning water into wine, and the top 500 words that I'd smashed out in about five minutes, read as if I'd had time after the match to write about Manchester United's greatness. The headline was good, obviously, and, and the, the pictures where I'd been changed to reflect Sheringham and Solskjaer. And he, he, he tapped me on the shoulder and, and said what he thought about that type of writing and came after me and offered me work. And when I moved to Spain, he was the one who said to one of the people organising Spanish football, phone Graham and get him involved in Revista de la Liga, which led to a reason to to stay in Spain, where I'd gone without any you know real language skills, maybe in English or Spanish, people might argue, no contacts, no money, no no real prospects or career path. And Revista, when early in my first summer in, in Spain, Revista was a reason to, to stay in and a, and a possibility of doing something interesting. And it became something really rewarding and glorious where still I'm, I'm working in Helsinki now for the 
European, you know, the UEFA Super Cup final. I'm working with people who are like, God, oh, it's terrible. As a kid, I used to watch you, and I can't believe, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and uh, no, I can't, listen, I have to balance all this nonsense out with, with a dig at myself, otherwise it wouldn't be me. But, Jared, that, that literally was life-changing. Uh, I think you came on here saying this was really difficult, but you, you've made it look effortless in terms of uh, <laughs> smashing it out of the ballpark with the first one. OK, so we, we totally accept Ferguson uh, in 99 in the Champions League final. That's um, a sensational bit there. Fran in 2004, this is going to seem hipster to people, but w- what's the story with this? So, <sighs> before Xavi and Iniesta in particular, a messy reteach the world what I suppose Billy Bremer and Kevin Keegan had, had taught them and John Giles early on. He was this little man and he was slight, he was very small and he was playing in this um, super depot site whereby a completely regional, there's going to be a, a gratuitous mention of Aberdeen again, a completely regional, you know, a fishing port far up the ferocious north of Spain with, with a not particularly big population base is ploughing its way through Spanish football. They've won the league in recent seasons. They've won the cup on the centenary of the cup day on Real Madrid's birthday in the Bernabeu against Real Madrid. And in in this edition of the Champions League, they've progressed to play AC Milan, the reigning champions of Europe, and Chilotti's team with Seedorf and Gattuso and Perlo and Shift. You probably don't know these guys. It's a really Italian-based story. You know, Sheva and, and Kaká and all this guys. It's, it's a quite a good team. And I'd been in San Siro, whatever it was, two weeks before, where Deportivo La Coruña had led. And then Kaká in particular, but Sheva and Pirlo had just, as David Coleman would say, opened their legs and showed their class. And suddenly it was 4 1 against Deportivo La Coruña in Milan. And it shouldn't have been that because throughout that game they felt, and you kind of think in your head, well, Wow, all right, they, they, that margin's wrong, that scoreline is unfair, but maybe, you know, football hierarchy is just shuffling and, and the, you know, the, the, the spine uh, is just getting back into place. That's the way it is. And Deportivo La Coruña take them to the Riasor on a, a, a lovely night in, in La Coruña, up in Galicia. And from the fifth minute when I think it was Pandiani who opened the scoring, they ran Milan off their legs. Spoiler, they win 4 0 to go through 5 4. But Fran is the little guy who padded around. I'm not saying he wasn't fast enough to say it felt like his feet never touched the ground, but he definitely padded around and went into little spaces whereby Milan, who were already looking at each other and looking to Ancelotti on the side, going, What's happening? Because everybody else. For Depor was just buzzing about and whirring, and the rear saw, which felt like a, a, a pretty old fashioned sort of tin or corrugated iron based stadium. People were banging on the corrugated iron, the stadium was jumping up and down. European champions were reeling, and at the heart of it was this little maestro who was just going, right, Well, Milan are dazed and dazzled, I'm going to pop them and torment them and prod them. And then score the fourth goal when when they're through on away goals because those beautiful things existed in those days. So at three nil up because they scored in Milan, they're already through. And the Fran just goes, show, show me where, where where's the cake? There's the there's the cherry right on top. We love that Deportivo team here in Ireland because Shelburne played against them in that Champions League and drew nil all in the old Lansdowne Road before it got redeveloped. And then. It was nil all at half time in the second leg in the Riazor, and then Depor win three nil in the second half. So I think um, a lot of people. That's frustrating for you because it could have been Shells doing that to Milan. I, you know, had <laughs> it literally, it probably should have been. So that that's one of the reasons I raised this. Yeah. Very good, very good. So Fran, that's also brilliant. Uh, Leo Messi. I mean, I, I guess the the other thing that happens is that uh, the world's focus comes to Barcelona, and you're right there watching this 17 year old kid progress. Is the 2009 final the one that you've picked because that's his masterpiece? Three. It's out of um, the most difficult panorama to try and say one moment when Messi took me out of myself and said, look, this is why football is beautiful, why it's the best sport ever invented, why you love it, why this, this kid from 60, 1963 is still childlike with enthusiasm in 2009. So to pick it and, and even to try and argue one night was Messi's masterpiece would be infantile on my part. 
But what probably hasn't come out over the twenty something years we've known each other is I'm I'm extremely chippy. You know, it, it literally <laughs> is what drives me. So I've been watching Messi for a handful of years. It was already clear in 2009 that we were talking about somebody with genius-like ability. But at that stage, irrespective of Spanish football being very uh, popular in, in UK, and at that stage, I didn't know the Irish scene quite so well, and I don't think there were as many doubters, but there was a raft of people in Fleet Street going, yeah, yeah, too much Messi. He's never scored against an English team. And they quoted, I don't know, six, or maybe six or seven incidents where, like, for example, although when he played Mourinho's Chelsea um, at Stamford Bridge in the mud, when Rijkaard's Barcelona won on the night when Asiel Del Orno tried to remove Messi's leg with studs in about, you know, the area that he can reproduce children with, he, he'd been so outstandingly brilliant that night that whether he scored or not wasn't really the question. So going into the Rome final and going into Rome final where Manchester United probably got their team selection wrong, where Manchester United were still a really impressive 11. When it's when it's, it's Fergie, you're thinking, well, gosh, I wonder if Barcelona will wobble. I wonder if, having seen what happened at Stamford Bridge, you know, maybe this Barcelona side is, is a year or two off the... And that night, Messi... Um, Loves the ball. It's boiling hot. We subsequently know, so I'm not claiming knowledge at the time, that the players are in pieces when they come out. Pep Guardiola has arranged a gladiator-style video of showing them all the tough moments of the season. All their kids and wives are in there to the gladiator music and all this kind of stuff. And in the dressing room, the players have subsequently told us they're in tears. They come out, they're, they're half beaten before they stand on the pitch. And for five, six, seven, eight, nine minutes until PK and a bit of Valdez repel um, Cristiano Ronaldo from, from United taking the lead. From that moment onwards, there's her heroics from, you know, a, a three-quarters unfit in Iesta and a three-quarters un unfit Henri, and they score the open goal without Messi's involvement, the opening goal. But he plays as if this Champions League final against a really good side is, is a mere nothing to him. And then he caps the, the performance with... I've, I've often asked Xavi about what... You know, at only 1-0, where they, they're distinctly superior, but only 1-0, you couldn't... The, the final can go like that against a, a Cristiano Ronaldo side. What, what did you cross the ball to Messi for? There's Van der Sar, who subsequently, the poster of that moment, will, will, will show him looking, you know, with boggle-eyed, I can't even do an impression, where he's like, what's happening? And it's between Rio Ferdinand and Vidic, two towering, you know, monstrous, monstrously big footballers, and this little Leo Messi, who could, they could probably fit in their socks along with the shin pads. And Xavi looks up and goes, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll put it to the five foot seven guy. And he goes, well, he's the best hitter on the pitch. He's the best hitter in the club. He's not tall, but the natural thing was, if I had the ball on the right, I'd pop it over to him. And, it, and he gets up, and, and the ball's laid between the two defenders. How has he got that space? And he gets up. And literally, I don't care if you've got a, a, a geophysicist or some open university professor of you know, geometry, he shouldn't have been able to head it back over Van der Sar. It should have been physically impossible. But he does, and, and the moment is so special for him that his boot, his foot, the bones in his foot contract, like you often see, I'm sad to say, in car crashes where you see bits of shoes and sometimes clothes or glasses strewn over where the, the, in, in moments of crisis, the musculature of the human body contracts. And Messi's boot just slips off because he's going, oh, I'm going to score, it's the Champions League final. And he... And he just lands and, and picks his boot up in one movement and runs off and you're like, like the Fran moment. It's just like crowning crowning glory that night and it felt that there you are. We actually had the picture up there of him holding the boot, celebrating the goal. I, I had no idea why he was holding the boot. I didn't realise that it, it popped off but um, the, the athleticism... Yeah, just, it literally just dropped off and because I'm a little bit Celtic and I'm taught to do Celts you get spiritual moments where you're like, aha, this this was all meant. I suppose Chavi did mean it, so did Messi, so maybe that's tautological. Yeah, there you go. Would he have crossed the ball if they were 1-0 down? Well, listen, I'm answering for him because I haven't asked him that question, but really, given the number of times I've talked to Chavi about that, I'd say yes. 
Um, if there was pressure on, on Messi, um, which he obviously didn't really feel or, or display, there was a lot of pressure on the Spanish team in the 2010 World Cup final because we had expected them to kind of win the World Cup from a, a long way out. What they were doing was uh, picking up the trophy that we had ordained for them, I guess, four four years previously when they didn't and could have, and then two years previously they'd emerged as this, okay, now we're here. And they was like, well, you have to win the World Cup now because you're the best team. Um, but you've gone for Iker Casillas next in the 2010 World Cup final where Spain beat the Netherlands by a goal to nail after extra time. What was so special about Casillas' performance that night? Well... I think people falsely remember it as not a terrific final because there's been so much build-up saying it's the Cruyff final where the Clockwork Orange, who are in the third World Cup final, surely will win one now, surely they'll play better than they played during the tournament because they detracted quite fierce criticism from, from die-hard, high-church football experts in their own country getting to the final. But once there, the idea was that if if you unleash Schneider and Van der Vaart and, and Rob and, and so on, they'll be great. And, and Spain have been growing and growing and growing from being defeated by Switzerland in the first match. No nation had ever won the World Cup, having lost the first match, so here they were. And a semi-final display against Germany, irrespective of what people think about the 1-0 against Portugal, the 1-0 against uh, Paraguay, the, the, the performance against Germany, 1-0 only, that had been just a glorious, you know, from me to you, from you to me, from me to you, game of football, back and forward with Germany going, right, we'll play you at your own game. And it was gorgeous to be there. And it was very entertaining. So I think everybody thought, but it's ill-remembered because there were buckets of goal chances. There might not have been long stretches of extraordinary play. And I have no qualms about saying, although I don't think it was Van Marwijk that ordered them to go out and do it. Amongst the Dutch players, they went, we will we will batter these little men. We will knock them off the stride and then we'll win. It had been done to them, I think, by maybe German sides across all their club, the domestic careers, and all that. this is the way we'll do it. And it was it was a terrible mistake. It was really ugly. It should have been sanctioned by three red cards, in my opinion, not just one, although I would admit that there might have been a Spanish red card too for Puyol. Um, but, the, but there were buckets of chances. And because of the way in which the, the Iniesta goal has been deified and the way he reveals his vest to pay tribute to Danny Harkey, a dead friend, and, and the fact that, you know, it's it's such a special goal and it's construction built from one end to the other. It's forgotten that throughout the game, Casillas plays really well. And Casillas also is, I'm on the I'm on the pitch, I'm, throughout the match, I'm given a, a pitch position to about 12 metres to the right of Spain's dugout. So therefore, I haven't often experienced a match pitch side and, and you could reach out and touch or talk to the substitutes as they warm up. But it's the World Cup final. I've lived with this lot for seven or eight weeks. And Casillas is, is not only playing well, but he's keeping them believing because at some stage, particularly in extra time, the, 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 the players' legs have turned to jelly. They've talked about this a lot. There's a fear of losing. There's a fear of going to penalties. But the key moment is when um, Holland are 11 men and they're starting to break. They... they, they Robin has been unable to sh shake off Juan Captavilla at, at Spain's left back, and he's come into the middle. And there's this moment where I think, by memory, I haven't gone back and watched it, I think by memory, Schneider is, is falling and snaps off a pass as he's falling, which catches Spain out completely. They're not only too high up, but the centre halves are too wide and the ball goes through. And it's it's Robin against Ica Casillas. The previous season, they've been teammates for Real Madrid, so they've they've had this high noon Gary Cooper one-on-one -on -one stuff in training a lot. It's it's one of the things that's made Robin in, in those days a genuinely great footballer because he allied finishing to, to, to pace. And as they're going through, uh, I, it, it's the only time in my career reporting sport where everything has stopped. People talk a lot about you just start feeling about it's gone slow now. And then it feels like slow motion. I genuinely... Because so much one the people had been working with to win the World Cup, I thought my heart was going to stop, literally stop. And you're watching, and I can't explain. It must sound stupid how it feels as if it's. It, and he goes through, and you know, two hundred thousand times out of two hundred thousand, it should have been a goal. And and he just dives the wrong way. He anticipates what Robin's going to do, which is right foot bent to the keeper's left, and instead Robin 
I, I'm sure thinking I know what Ike's going to do, puts it to the keeper's right. And Casillas leaves out a leg, which we often see in penalties now, but he leaves out a leg, and it's the, the big toe of the upper boot, which must be his right foot. The, it's the toe. It doesn't even hit the face of the... the, the and it goes wide. And Robin sinks to his knees... And I've never seen, I saw in your earlier edition of Jonathan Wilson talking about the best, by a distance, without competition, that's the best save I've ever seen. It's another spiritual moment where you just go like, yeah, this is why I do this. This is why you run around countries carrying camera gear. This is why you, you're at four o'clock in the morning in some mad airport where the cops want to examine your stuff and the players are waiting and you're sweating and you're like seven, eight weeks away from you. This this is it. And at the end of the game, I liked Ike and we got on well. At the end of the game, I got an interview with him one-on-one -on -one and, and I just went, Ike, you and Arjun Robin, what was that moment like? And he just stopped and he went, big brown eyes and he, it was eternal. I thought, that'll do me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it has proven. Um, I, I think, obviously, the context always matters with this stuff too. So to win the World Cup with the save, it's like, you know, it's it's this the striker gets the opportunity to do it, but he he got it that time. Um, nice of Karim Benzema to know that we were doing this today to score last night to be relevant in the news today. But Benzema's form over the last year in particular has been sensational. So to bring us right up to date in 2021, this is the game against PSG. Yeah, no, I uh, I would have said it would be this year. I would have sorry, said 22. It would be, yeah. yeah, 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 because. Look, there, there's a special place in my affection for Karim Benzema because uh, I couldn't say that about everything he's done in his life outside football. But ever since I've seen him, which the first time I watched him was when Lyon came to the Camp Nou against Barcelona. They got they got hiding and he was very, very young. But it was very clear that this was somebody who uh, wasn't just an ordinary nine, that he could drift wide, that he was intelligent, that his use of space was good. And you thought, well, let's see how this guy develops. That's all I thought on the night. Interesting, nice to watch. At Real Madrid, he's been battered about. There was times when Mourinho didn't believe in him, where he had to go and batter down Mourinho's door to have an argument with him. As much as it's retrospectively recognised, nobody really thought of Karim Benzema as great because of the work he did for Cristiano Ronaldo, but he was. And then when Ronaldo left, he just went, brilliant, superb. Centre stage, here we go. And scored and scored and scored and scored and led... And in, in this season, I, I, I said I'm in Helsinki and therefore I've had access over the two days to, <clears throat> to lots of players who played in that Champions League winning side last season. And they've consistently said, despite what they did against Atleti in Lisbon, you know, winning an extra time after a, a final second equaliser, despite the, the, you know, the quality of the Bale goal against Liverpool, despite winning three in a row, a, a large chunk of Madrid's side have said that was the most emotional um, win last season because of the nature of the mad late goals against City, against Chelsea, you know, the final against a, a, a tough Liverpool side. But every one of them had said the turning point was Paris Saint-Germain. They played like stinking drains in Paris. They should have been beaten. Courtois was heroic. They come to the Bernabeu and for a big chunk of time, not only does Mbappe score, but he looks like he can score three. And it looks like they're out. And, and the reason I put this in is that when Colm was talking to me about this, and you mentioned it at the end about like moments to take you out of yourself. Again, I've never in a football stadium like done this, where you know I, I can't believe it. When you look at the short space of time that three goals that Benzema scores um, take place in, it's a blitzkrieg. And this one that I picked, the the, the moment, the performance, it's a hat trick. They go through. They all, all the Madrid players say that's the turning point where, you know, the, the Chelsea, Man City, and Liverpool performance has come from. Not just that they got through, but they were like, yeah, we can do anything. It's like they, they scored to go two, um, two nil up, and, and and that could see them through. And and Rodrigo comes on, he he, he wins the ball from Paris Saint Germain's um, kickoff, and, and I think it was Idrissa Gay. I I, I I might be wrong. He gets hustled, and they break. And the ball goes down the other end, and it's Vinicius Benzema. And Benzema scores. It's about, I'd say, 110 seconds from his second goal. And the Bernabeu is is just a phenomenal, 
it's, I can't even describe what it's like because you're there and they're a little bit arrogant because of everything they've done. They think they're going to go through all the time. And sometimes it's not like a library, but they're sitting there going, right, do something miraculous. Not entertain us. We're waiting for the miracle. And this night the miracle came from a context of rubbish in Paris, pretty outplayed for 55 minutes in their own patch. I don't think the crowd believed. And then Benzema was bang, bang, bang. Hat trick goal. It was just, and I, I literally, before I started working again, I was like, I don't believe what I've seen. And that fits into, it might not seem to an audience that has been like a transcendental match or moment, but it's in this because it fits what Colm said to me about just that moment where you're like, yeah, this, this is what it's all about. And I'm just, you're transformed into a spectator, not a fan of either of the sides, but you're just there going all hail football. Yeah, Graham, I had very high expectations about this slot and you've managed to smash those. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Lads, 